we turn now to the legends of mankind. I shall try to divide them so as to represent in their order the several stages of this great event. This of course will be difficult to do. First I shall present one or two legends that most clearly represent the first coming of the monster. The dragon, the serpent, the wolf, the dog, the evil one, the comet. The second Hindu avatar gives the following description of the rapid advance of some dreadful object from out of space and its tremendous fall upon the earth by the power of God. There issued from the essence of Brahma, a being shaped like a boar. It was white and exceeding small. This being, in the space of an hour, grew to the size of an elephant of the largest size and remained in the air. That is to say, it was an atmospheric, not a terrestrial creature, similar to Iatha. Brahma was astonished on beholding this figure and discovered by the force of internal penetration that it could be nothing but the power of the Omnipotent which had assumed a body and become visible. He now felt that God is all in all and all is from him and all in him and said to Mari Chi and his sons the attendant genie a wonderful animal has emanated from my essence at first of the smallest size it has in one hour increased to this enormous bulk and without doubt it is a portion of the almighty power Brahma, an earthly king, was at first frightened by the terrible spectacle in the air and then claimed that he produced it himself. They were engaged in this conversation when the Vara or boar form suddenly uttered a sound like the loudest thunder and the echo reverberated and shook all the quarters of the universe. This is the same terrible noise which would necessarily result from hydrogen of the comet exploding in our atmosphere. The legend continues. But still, under this dreadful awe of heaven, a certain wonderful divine confidence secretly animated the hearts of Brahma. Mari Chi and the other genie, who immediately began praises and thanksgiving. That Vara bore form figure, hearing the power of the Vedas and the mantras from their mouth, again made a loud noise and became a dreadful spectacle, shaking the full flowing mane which hung down its neck on both sides and erecting the humid hairs of his body. He proudly displayed his two most exceedingly white tusks, then rolling about his wine-colored red eyes and erecting his tail. He descended from the region of the air and plunged head first into the water. The whole body of water was convulsed by the motion and began to rise in waves. While the guardian spirit of the sea, being terrified, began to tremble for his domain and cried for mercy. Flowfully does this legend accord with the descriptions of the comet given by astronomers, the horrid hair, the mane, and the animal-like head. Compare it with Mr. Lockyer's account of Gagaya's comet. The image was taken in 1874. This looks like a fallen angel. Mr. Lockyer's account of Gagaya's, which he described as having a head like a fan-shaped projection of light with ear-like appendages on each side, which sympathetically complemented each other at every stage, form or luminosity. In this I see the winged disc or the caduceus and helmet. We turn to the legends of another race, 
the Vendavesta of the ancient Persians, describes a period of great innocence and happiness on earth. There was a man bull who resided on an elevated region which the deity had assigned him. This was probably a line of kings or a nation whose symbol was the bull. As we see in Bel or Baal with the bull's horns dwelling in some elevated mountainous region. At last, an evil one dominated Ahriman, corrupted the world after having dared visit heaven. That is, he appeared first in the heavens, then descended upon the earth and took the form of a serpent. That is to say, a serpent-like comet struck the earth. This would be the transition of Tiamat to Mushuzu. As you can see, the Persians did not take Tiamat forward. It is Mushusu that clearly takes the form of the Great Serpent. Meanwhile, Ahiraman threw the whole universe into confusion, chaos. For that enemy of good mingled himself with everything and appeared everywhere and sought to do mischief above and below. Like I said, I believe there is something attached to this. And do not forget that the demons in ancient Babylon are usually referred to as poison. The Jinn, the Genie, the Fallen Angels, the Odug, the Otaku, the Sabiti Seven, etc, etc, etc. They all have a similar description, which is a variant of poison. And we shall find, through all of these legends, allusions to the poisonous and deadly gases brought to the Earth by the comet. We have already seen that the gases, which are proved to be associated with comets, are fatal to life. The traditions of the ancient Britons tell us of an ancient time when the reckless extravagance of mankind had provoked the Great Supreme to send a pestilence wind upon the earth. This would be Zoo. A pure poison descended. Every blast was death. At this time, the Patriarch, distinguished for his integrity, was enclosed together with his select company in the enclosure with the strong door. This may be a cave or tomb. This of course is very interesting. According to the Druids, the telepaths were sent high into the mountains to granite man-made caves to protect them from an electrical storm caused by a meteor shower Apparently, the granite protected their telepathy. Those who lost their telepathy would be left in a world of unknowing, and the description of such a scene would be chaos and corruption. Their minds were corrupted by the waveform God. Here, behind the strong door, the Just Ones were safe from injury. A tempest of fire arose. It split the earth asunder to the great deep. The Lake Lyon burst its bounds, and the waves of the sea lifted themselves high around the borders of Britain. The rain poured down from the heaven, and the waters covered the earth. Here we have the whole story told briefly, but with these regular sequence of events. 1. The poisonous gases. 2. The people seek shelter in the caves. 3. The earth takes fire. 4. The earth is cleft open, the fjords are made, and the trap rocks burst forth. 5. The rain pours down. 6. There is a season of floods. We turn now to the Greek legends. As recorded by one of their most ancient writers, Hesiod, we find the coming of the comet clearly depicted. 
We shall see here, as in many other legends, a reference to the fact that there was more than one monster in the sky. This is in accordance with what we know to be true of comets. They often appear in pairs, or even triplets. We have seen in the past, Biela's comet divide and form two separate comets, pursuing their course side by side. When the Great Comet of 1811 appeared, another of almost equal magnitude followed it. Seneca informs us that Ephoras, a Greek writer in the 4th century BC, had recorded a singular fact of a comet's separation into two parts. This statement was deemed incredible by the Roman philosopher. Recent observations of similar phenomena leave no room to question this historian's veracity. The Chinese annals record the appearance of three comets, one large and two smaller ones. At the same time, in the year 896 AD, they travelled together for three days. The little ones disappeared first, and then the large one. And again, on June 27, 416 AD, two comets appeared in the constellation Hercules and pursued nearly the same path. If mere proximity to Earth served to split Biela's comet into two fragments, why might not a comet which came near enough to strike Earth be broken into several separate forms? The seven were one. So that there is nothing improbable in Hesiod's description of the two or three aerial monsters appearing at or about the same time, or of one being the apparent offspring of the other, since a large comet like Biela's may have broken in two before the eyes of the people. This is the fallen angel, the rock, which means darkness. Hesiod tells us that the earth united with night to do a terrible deed by which the heavens were deeply wronged. This would be the birth of Eros, the so-called Cupid of love, born of the darkness. The earth prepared a sickle of white iron with jagged teeth, and stationed him in ambush. And when heaven came, Cronus, his son, grasped at him. And with his huge sickle, long and jagged, cruelly wounded him. This would be a metaphor for the stinger of Scorpio, but as we can clearly see in the Greek myth, the sickle is now allocated a new position, as it is now created on earth as a weapon against heaven. But this possibly describes the aftermath of the comet's destruction, where the heavens would be obstructed by the toxic gases. And night bore also Hateful Destiny, Black Fate, Death, and Nemesis. And Hesiod tells us that she, probably Night, brought forth another monster. Beautiful, irresistible, in no way like mortal man or the immortal gods. This is the Divine Storm Bird. In a hollow cavern, this would be Agatha, Shambhala the inner earth, Hades. Stubborn-hearted Echidna, a half-nymph with dark eyes and fair cheeks. A serpent, huge, terrible and vast, speckled and flesh-devouring in the caves of the sacred earth. With her, they said that Typhon associated in love a terrible and lawless ravisher for the dark-eyed maid. But she, and Chidna, bore Chimera, breathing restless fire, fierce and huge, 
fleet-footed as well as strong. This monster had three heads, one indeed of a grim vision of a lion, one of a goat, and another of a serpent, a fierce dragon, breathing forth the dreaded strength of burning fire. Her pegasus slew, and brave Bellerophon. The astronomical works show what weird, fantastic, and goblin-like shapes the comets assume under the telescope. If we can imagine one of these monsters close to the Earth, we can readily suppose that the excited people looking at the dreadful spectacle, as the Hindu legend called it, saw it taking the shape of serpents, dragons, birds, and wolves. And Hesiod proceeds to tell us more about this fiery, serpent-like monster. But when Jove had driven the Titans out from heaven, the huge Earth bore her youngest born son, Typhon, by the embrace of Tartarus, Hell, through the golden Aphrodite, Venus, whose hands indeed are apt for the deeds on the score of strength, and untiring the feet of the strong God, and from his shoulders there were a hundred heads of a serpent, a fiery dragon playing with dusky tongues, tongues of fire and smoke, and from the eyes are sparkled beneath the brows, whilst from all of his heads fire was gleaming as he looked keenly on. In all his terrible heads, too, were voices sending forth every kind of voice, ineffable. For one while, Indeed, they would utter sounds, so as for the gods to understand. And at another time, again, the voice of a loud bellowing bull, untamable in force, and proud in utterance. At another time, again, that of a lion possessing a daring spirit. At another time, again, they would sound like whelps, wondrous to hear. And at another time, he would hiss, and the lofty mountains resounded. Then would there have been done a deed past remedy. This means after the arrival. And he, even he, would have reigned over mortals and immortals. Unless the sire of the gods and men had quickly observed him, Harshly, then he thundered, and heavily and terribly, the earth re-echoed around, and the broad heaven above, the sea and streams of ocean, and the abysses of the earth. But beneath his immortal feet, vast Olympus trembled, as the king uprose, and earth groaned beneath. And the heat from both caught the dark-coloured sea, both of the thunder and the lightning and the fire from the monster, the heat arising from the thunderstorms, winds and burning lightning, and all earth, heaven and sea were boiling, and huge billows roared around the shores beneath the violence of the gods, and loud quaking arose, Pluto trembled, the monarch of the dead beneath, and the titans under Tartarus. Standing about Cronus, he trembled also, on account of the unceasing tumult, and dreadful contention. But Jove, when in truth he had raised high his wrath, and taken his arms, his thunder, and lightning, and smoking bolt, leaped up and smote him from Olympus. 
and scorched all around the wondrous heads of the terrible monster. But when at length he had quelled it, after having smitten it with blows, the monster fell down, lame. The huge earth groaned, but the flame from the lightning-blasted monster flashed forth in the mountain hollows, hidden and rugged, when he was stricken, was burnt and melted by the boundless vapor. Like as pewter, heated by the art of youth, and by the well-bored melting pit or iron, subdued in the dells of the mountain by blazing fire, melts in the sacred earth beneath the hands of Vulcan. So was the earth melted in the glare of this burning fire, then troubled in spirit, he hurled him into wide Tartarus. So here we have a very faithful and accurate narrative of the coming of the comet. Born of night, a monster appears, a serpent, huge, terrible, speckled and flesh-devouring. With her is another comet, Tyaphon. They beget Chimera, that breathes resistless fire, fierce, huge and swift. And Typhon is associated with both of these, and is the dreadful monster of all, born of hell and sensual sin much like Anzu. A serpent, a fiery dragon, with dusky tongues and fire gleaming, sending forth dreadful and appalling noises, while mountains and fields shake with earthquakes. Chaos has come, the earth and the sea boils. There is unceasing tumult and contention, and in the midst of the monster, wounded and broken up, falls upon the earth. The earth groans under his weight, and there he blazes and burns for a time, in the mountain fastness and the desert places, melting the earth with boundless vapor and glaring fire. We will find legend after legend about this. Typhon, he runs through the mythologies of different nations. That's why there may be a precursor. Zu may be the precursor and as to his size and terrible power, they all agree. He was no earth creature, he moved in the air, he reached the skies. According to Pindar, the head of Typhon reached to the stars, his eyes darted fire, his hands extended from east to west. Terrible serpents were entwined about the middle of his body, and one hundred snakes took the place of fingers on his hands. Between him and the gods, there was a dreadful war. Jupiter finally killed him with a flash of lightning, and buried him under Mount Etna, and there, smoking and burning, his great throwess and ritherings, we are told, still shake the earth, and threaten mankind, to this day. And with pale lips men say, Tomorrow, perchance today, Enclodus may arise. This is most certainly the flood storm weapon, the Anzu bird, who also aligns with Jupiter. Yet again he is killing his former self. The new empire defeats his former role with a new role. It would also be the arrival of It in the movie It Chapter 2. The prophetic warning should be known to all humanity. The warning is, when the stinger of Scorpio is brightest, the flood storm weapon will come. I believe this is related to the zodiac, and the cycle will be 6,000 years. By my calculations, we are 20 years from the next cataclysmic event. We do not stand a chance, living in the brightest of cities. It is the heavens that are truly veiled, 
and we are blinded by the light. Next we look into Ragnarok and the coming of the comet. In the meantime, one should watch Eros, Ayatha and Ion, as this godlike entity is described as a son of this cataclysmic event, and who is worshipped under many different disguises. I would like to say that it is either the event itself, or something that was attached to the meteor that hit Earth, like a parasite or waveform radiation that our human bodies would have soaked up like sponges, possibly altering our physiology in some unpredictable manner. As mentioned in the texts, there is nothing godly about this entity. And I find the similarities between the birth of Eros, Aetha and Ion are transparent, similar to the meteor hitting the earth and landing in the ocean which would have been split asunder. But he was born in the Great Abyss, which again leads me to think of the Fomorians, which translates as Undersea Ones. They were beast-like, goat-headed giants, and also Owans, who also came from under the sea, who was thought to be Enki, which leads me to the descriptions of the son of Enki, Iabani Enkidu, the beast man or satyr, that appears from my point of view that they were a people who were hit by this radiation or mutation. And to further this perspective, it is also in the accounts of the Druids, in relation to the Fomorians. Apparently, those who were hit by this cataclysm became animalistic in nature. Because of losing their telepathy, they would have been frantic, unable to speak and incredibly confused. According to the myth, they are said to have left island and settled in Greece long before it was inhabited. Actually, it would be all of the Caucasus mountain region then as the waters subsided, they would have populated all of the surrounding areas, which includes Mesopotamia, Africa, Scandinavia and Asia. My point here is that the entity on many occasions, Tehut, Oans, Votan, Odin, Quetzalcoatl, Lu and Loki, etc. And like Oans and Ki, they all brought language and civilization. But understanding the Druids' perspective of those who lost their telepathy leaving Ireland, would this mean that this figure bringing language was a High Druid, possibly still with telepathy, a Shining One, who left with the knowledge of the Druids and became a God among men due to his ability and knowledge? It would explain the divergence between the Irish Celts and the Scandinavian. The written word and the use of language would possibly have prevented the population from reconnecting with one another. Take modern society as an example. Where is your first point of call for information? A book, the internet. And much like the internet, humanity's inner net may need a connection a human connection. No, this does not have to be physical. In regards to my work, I try to get into the minds of the people, to connect via emotion to my ancient ancestors. I understand purpose, process, and the rippling effects they can have, just by plodding on and working one step at a time. I have gained an incredible overview of the situation. A bird's eye view, if you can forgive the term. Which leads me to finish where I started. The ancient mystery began with a vision of the entity riding the chariot.
please hit that notification bell to ensure you are notified of each upload. Share, like, comment and subscribe to support the channel. For more Ancient Mystery.